Uh, the topic tonight is the hippies, an understanding of whom we must, I guess, acquire or die painfully. Uh, we certainly should make considerable progress in the next hour because we have with us a professional student of the hippies, as also someone who is said to have started the whole beat generation business, and finally a hippie type who can correct us ever so gently, please, uh, if we are wrong. Mr. Louis Yablonsky is a sociologist who studied at Rutgers and took his doctorate at New York University and teaches at San Fernando State College in California, where he is chairman of his department. Uh, his first book, uh, which focused on teenage gang life and drug addiction, prepared him for his magnum opus, which is called The Hippie Trip, <laughs> a first-hand account of the beliefs and behavior of hippies in America. Uh, Mr. J Jack uh, Kerouac over here became famous when his book On the Road was published. Uh, it seemed to be preaching a life of disengagement, making a virtue out of restlessness. Uh, the irony is that when the book was belatedly published in 1958, seven years after it was written, Mr. Kerouac had fought his way out of the beat generation and is now, if not exactly orthodox, uh, at least a regular practicing novelist whose thirteenth book, The Vanity of Delos, is widely regarded as his best. Mr. Ed Sanders is a musician, a poet, and a polemicist. He is one of the Fugs, a widely patronized combo. He has published four books of poetry and has vigorously preached pacifism for a number of years. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Sanders whether we have serious terminological problems. For instance, uh, are you a, a hippie, Mr. Sanders? And if not, wherein not? Well, I, I'm not exactly a hippie. I mean, I have certain uh, uh, sentiments for that, hmm. quote, hippie movement, uh, unquote. Uh, I would th say that I'm differed from the hippies in that I would have a more radical uh, political solution to the problems of this part of the century. And I have uh, my roots more strongly in, uh, say, the classical tradition and in poetry and literature rather than in uh, dope and street sex. This, this you think... Um, and you uh, wrote, you published that magazine called what? called uh, Gutter Expletive, a magazine of the arts. <laughs> well, now, uh, do, do I understand from this that we, that we are supposed to make the inference that the hippies don't have a highly developed uh, political uh, schedule, a highly, uh, a highly developed political ideology? Is it the problem with the terms, like hippie, is that they have a definition foisted on them by the media, and that uh, the mm. word hippie is... Uh, has been limited by the necessities of the uh, uh, type of journalists that promote it. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't rely on the name, name hippie to include a human being, you know, the, everything about a hum particular human being, you know. So uh, it's a bad term, I think, because it has no meaning. I remember I think of hippopotamus, and I mean, you, th you know, it's like, it's, it's, it has no uh, other uh, connections, spiritual and emotional, like, say, beat, the beat, uh, generation title had, you know, it had other implications. But the word hippie, you immediately think of, uh, uh, you don't have any good connections. Well, I kind of disagree with okay. that. I, I spent last year traveling around the country, uh, various communes and various uh, Haight-Ashbury, Lower East Side, various city scenes, and there was an identifiable, uh, I define a hippie as a rather generally a young person, uh, in several categories, there's kind of a, a priestly type. I would include Allen Ginsberg and Tim Leary and individuals like that in that yes, category. Uh, people uh, try searching for uh, some loving solutions to society's ills, uh, trying to tune into the cosmos, whatever that means. We can explore that. Generally using psychedelic drugs, uh, and then uh, there's a whole cadre of individuals who, uh, uh, whom I've termed uh, novices, who are uh, attempting to achieve a certain uh, 
transcendental state. Then there's a lot of teeny bopper kids who are uh, sort of uh, uh, hanging on. Then there's some ancient folks like Kerouac here who. Why ancient? couldn't you keep quiet while I was talking? I'll keep quiet when you talk. Yeah, yeah that's a no, fair enough, isn't it? What? I think that's fair enough, your request. You said cadres, cadre. Well, I'm sorry. Spanish I words. apologize. I, right. <laughs> my semantics are. And I showed my thumbs down to Ginsburg over there in the back. Oh, he's a nice fella. Yeah, we'll throw him to the lions. Well, what about it, uh, Mr. Kerouac? Uh, your exercise about something, you know, or buy something. Restless uh, is, is it, true. Uh, you had the right word, restless. Uh, that's right. Eh? Well, what, what, what is it that, uh, that in your judgment, uh, uh, distinguishes the, the hippie movement from, for instance, or simply a routine Get your radical question over political yes. movement? What? No, I, I interrupted your sentence. Yeah. Sent <laughs> sentence. Yeah, I say, what, what, what distinguishes the hippie movement from simply an orthodox, radical, uh, say, uh, Nothing. Adamite... Uh, Movement. Atomite? Mm, there was a Adam? Cause. Adam and Eve or Atom? Adam. <laughs> I think Adam and Eve. What's an Adam and Eve? What's Adamite? Well, Where they all wear their, la their hair long, layers, and caves? Yeah, and sort of back to nature and uh, uh, well, that's ex ex exclusive concern for one's might own have to in due time pleasure. after the Atomite mm. bomb. <laughs> Hey, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> good all the time, boy. <laughs> Give that man a drink. <laughs> now, Jack, <clears throat> Mr. Kerouac, what I want to ask is this. To what extent do you believe that the beat generation is related to the, to the hippies? Oh, what, what do they have in common? Was this an evolution from the one to the other? It's just the older ones. Yeah. See, I'm 46 years old. These kids are 18. It's the same movement, which is apparently some kind of Dionysian movement in late civilization, and mm -hmm. which I, uh, I did not intend any more than, I suppose, Dionysius did, or whatever his name was. But uh, although I'm not Dionysius the Euro Europagite, <laughs> I should have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the point, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's, it's just a movement which is a... a Supposed to be licentious, but it isn't really. Well, not licentious in, in what respect? The hippies are good kids. They're better than the beat. The beats, uh, see, Ginsburg and I, and, well, Ginsburg, boy. We're, 40, we're all in our 40s, mm -hmm. and we started this, and the kids took it up and everything. And, but uh, a lot of hoods, hoodlums, and uh, communists jumped on our backs. Mm -hmm. Well, on my back, not his. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ferlinghetti jumped jumped on my back and and turned the idea that I had that the the B generation was a, a generation of beatitude and pleasure in life and tenderness, but they called it in the papers a beat mutiny, mm -hmm. beat insurrection. W words I never used. Mm -hmm. Being a Catholic, I believe in order tenderness and piety well then your point was that a meeting that a that rather that a movement which you conceived as relatively pure has become uh, ideologized and uh, misanthropic and uh, generally uh, a movement that was objectionable no a movement that was considered what pure yes it was pure in my heart mm -hmm. What about that, Mr. Blanc? Do you, do you, do you uh, see that as having happened somewhere between well, I, the beats I, and the hippies? I think there's, uh, uh, in early 67, going back to around, oh, I suppose, 64 or 5, there were a lot of people what? trying to kind of uh, return to sort of an Indian style of life or relate to the land differently, uh, mm -hmm. uh, trying to... Uh, uh, to uh, love each other in... Uh, and, and communicate, be more open with each other. And I think it, uh, recently it's, uh, it's taken a turn in a violent direction. Uh, a, a lot of uh, responsibility, I think, is due to drugs like methadrine, the amphetamines, uh, uh, and perhaps the, uh, the overuse, uh, uh, because it's been around for quite a while now, of, of 
drugs like LSD. How about the herring? What is herring? Is that kind of a drug? It's a cherry herring. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, Kerouac still on, uh, is and out herring. of style. He's still on alcohol, which is... Uh, you know, I'm on there, alcohol. There, there, there are other drug drugs out. now. That's, uh, How about that, Miss Sanders? Is that out of style? Well, I, you mentioned misanthropic uh, and objectionable. I think that... Misanthropic. Many of the uh, so-called misanthropic elements of this generation is are due to uh, the war. Well, and that you have a surly generation of draft eligible but literate and uh, articulate people who are who are confronted with the hideous probability of having to go yes, to an Asian war land war against, against and that Israel. and that uh, so they have to go to war and they're faced with this this looming gloomy future <coughs> and that rather than die in Vietnam they'd rather prepare themselves to articulate a lifestyle in the streets and in the open that, that, re that really reflects something they really want to do rather than this other thing you have to do later on they don't really believe in and they will do because uh, push comes to shove, well, most kids go to war. Mm -hmm. you know. Of course, the trouble with that is it doesn't account, for instance, for the restlessness in, say, Paris, where they don't have that particular problem, does it? Well, that's the up-against-the-wall syndrome. Who's Daniel Cohn-Bendit? I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Sanders, I'm interested in, in the trying to... Uh, pin this point down because a lot of us have heard that the restlessness of so much of American youth, uh, which has contributed to the growth of the hippie movement, has to do with the trauma of Vietnam. But then all of a sudden, a while ago in, in France, the entire, what seemed like the entire student uh, population exploded, uh, even though that particular provocation was singularly, in fact conspicuously, absent. France having been officially very pro-North Vietnam, very anti-American. Uh, now, how do you account for that, and has uh, it caused you to perhaps look in for more generic sources? Of I think order? it's the uh, nefarious uh, occurrence in French civilization of Madame de Gaulle. Madame de Gaulle? Because she has uh, exercised a noxious influence on French television, sitting up and personally censoring it. And uh, I think, <laughs> no, I think I th it's absolutely true. And I think that uh, when you have a, uh, a type of uh, obnoxious matriarchy as, uh, uh, that's evident in France, plus a encrusted, boring, <coughs> boorish uh, university structure, and uh, the, this, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, the old man himself, and who wouldn't? I mean, there's a whole thing to God. There's a there's a huge structure there to re revolt against. So, you know, as Madame de Gaulle is roughly equal to Vietnam. She's uh, Madame Nu. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, Professor Yablonski, what would you say if a student of yours told you that? <laughs> well, I think in in the United States, uh, the hippies, uh, with all the tantamount difficulties of defining them come from the uh, middle, upper classes, upper socioeconomic situation. And these are generally uh, people who have uh, tasted uh, the best that American society seems to have to offer. They, they have access to all the goodies, and they're turned off by it. They feel that it's kind of a plastic society. There's no room for political change. I'm talking about the pure hippie. The pure hippie isn't particularly involved in politics. He sort of uh, retreats from that. He's, he's with, withdrawn from it. And he's involved in, uh, I mentioned the term cosmic consciousness before. There is uh, an experience one seems to get under LSD mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of uh, people talk about as putting them in touch with all things, with all people. And there's uh, an effort, uh, kind of an extremist effort at love that seems to <coughs> dominate the, uh, uh, the hippie scene and uh, a retreat from uh, uh, politics. Uh, well, is, is there a causal relation between uh, their going, the, 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 they're adopting these attitudes and the Vietnam War, uh, or do you, do you reject the Vietnam War as the, the, the proximate cause I think of the, this movement. The Vietnam War is, is uh, part of it. Uh, but if there had been no Vietnam War, we might have had the, the identical thing, is that your point? Well, I think uh, part, uh, there are a lot of, there's no single cause for, for a particular movement. I think part of it may have been the, the assassination of, of JFK. I think people on the left 
felt that through the establishment, through political devices, uh, uh, the society could move in other uh, directions. And then... Uh, in what direction was it moving in 1963 that was pleasing to them? Uh, there was uh, a, a, a movement towards uh, greater welfare programs, towards uh, uh, resolving in some ways the civil rights issue. There seemed to be some hope. And then this seemed to be snapped off, and uh, a lot of kids who went to but Mississippi... If I may say so, precisely the movements that didn't get passed in 1961, 62, and 63, of the kind you just enumerated, were passed in 64, 65, 66. So there would seem to be almost a negative correlation between the civil rights legislation and welfare passages well, and the growth of the movement. I think if you cross-compare the, the limited JFK administration and the rather lengthy LBJ administration, I think uh, the LBJ situation has kind of been a, uh, going through the motions of doing something. And there was a certain, I feel, uh, and, and a lot of people have told me, the spirit of foot in the country. And, there seemed to be a bit of a, of, of a revival with, uh, uh, with Bobby Kennedy. And uh, here again, uh, uh, and, and to some extent, the McCarthy uh, involvement. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, people are turned off from the political establishment because they don't see any hope for uh, changing it. That is, they use terms like uh, plastic and uh, more more severe words about it, and uh, they've, they've disengaged. Uh, they're uncommitted to it. How about that, Mr. Karak? Does that make sense to you the, in terms of... <coughs> I lost the entire train of thought. Well, the, tra the train of thought has to do with whether, um, uh, whether in the last few years people have ceased to look at the political processes as profitable in terms of bringing on the kind of world they want to live in and, and maybe that has something to do with the assassination of Kennedy, that kind of thing. No, that was an accident. I, I refer back to uh, Count Leo Tolstoy, who wrote War and Peace, you know, Leo Tolstoy, who said that at one time, uh, the, uh, the, the hourglass, that the sand is coming down from one top of the hourglass down to the other, and that will be the end of war. I think that war will be over fairly soon, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. although I don't know for sure. <laughs> That's what Tolstoy said, and well, he was the guy who yeah, taught Gandhi and Thoreau, mm -hmm. yeah. Henry David Thoreau. Yeah, I told him a lot of foolish things. I was no, but I didn't get the, the <clears throat> full context of your question. Well, the full context of the question is, are, are a significant number of Americans precisely at an age <laughs> when we enunciated the great society uh, oh, great society. I.e., the society that was actually going to introduce politics as, as far relevant as I'm in, in everything. Uh, 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 are they disillusioned, and does this have to do with the growth of the hippie movement? In the first place, I think that the, the Vietnamese War is nothing but a, a plot between the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese, who are cousins, to get jeeps in the country. <laughs> 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 As for the They're not very good plotters, are they? <laughs> but they got a lot of jeeps. <laughs> I think they're but pulling they, the wool over our eyes and we're little be, American lambs. They turned out to be more expensive than Sears Roebuck jeeps. Yes. Didn't they? But I, that's what I really think there. Uh, as for the Russian takeover of Czechoslovakia, that showed the world what they're like, mm -hmm. what the communists are really like. They're really fascists. Well, yeah, I don't guess anybody doubted that, except maybe Mr. Sanders, right? No, I, I, I think it was a terrible thing, you know, and I, uh, if I were in Czechoslovakia and a Czechoslovakian student, I'd be putting out a, a, an underground newspaper and doing my best called to... Called what? Called Gutter Expletive. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, since, since, you, spell, since, since you are in Czechoslovakia, uh, Mr. Sanders, what do you consider it appropriate to do in the United States? During the, during the presidential campaign? Yeah, by way of protest against the Czechoslovakian... Uh, oh, business. well, I recommend uh, uh, sit-ins in front of the Russian missions. What for? To uh, vigorously and more uh, forcefully, yet non-violently, uh, to witness against it. 
I would advocate uh, writing articles and advocate, uh, you know, maybe going to Czechoslovakia. I mean, uh, we may, the Fugs are going to Europe in a couple of weeks, and we may you just... you going to bring your carbines? We're going to the Essen Song Festival in Germany, and we just may try to freak across to Czechoslovakia to uh, visit uh, yeah. Kafka's birth place, I guess. Was he born in Prague? Yeah. yeah. So we may go a play, have a homage to uh, Kafka with the, uh, uh, with our band. Well, do, do, do you draw any, uh, do you draw any generalities on the basis of the behavior of the Soviet Union which instruct you in assessing other political situations? Like yeah, o, like Mayor know. Daley in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And what, what are those? You well, those are that when you, <coughs> when you attempt to essentially peacefully gather together to press a point about a war or about a, about a freedom or about freedom of journalism, that when you're confronted with people like uh, Duke, uh, like the Soviet leaders and like the uh, leaders in Chicago, namely Mayor Daley and uh, Mr. Stahl and Mr. Barger of the Chicago uh, uh, Municipal Office, that you're, conf you're confronted with essentially the same position. You're not, you're allowed, you're clubbed, you're maced, you're gassed, you're freaked, zapped, pushed over. If you're an old lady, you're thrown through a plate glass window. If you're a cripple, you're thrown against a street light. If you're a peaceful, long-haired, loving protester, you're smashed and knocked down. If you're a cameraman, you're bricked and your camera's destroyed and your, your blood is splattered all over you. I mean, it's, it's a nefarious scene and there's, there's, there's all kinds of correlations. And what the only, the only uh, what the lesson you would draw would be to uh, prepare yourself and, you know, in the sense of if you're nonviolent like I am and if you believe in pacifism, you will attempt to create a body of love and light so that that thing can't happen, that there'll be so many loving people there that you will have a festival of life and all its attributes, and you can do that by, by praying together, by loving together, by... Uh, Alan was singing Aum in the streets, which is the Hindu uh, benevolent word, and uh, by, doing, by getting together and creating love, I think it's a great force, in, at least in allowing you to demonstrate in the United States against uh, uh, Daly, who is, uh, you know, like a, it's Al Capone, you know, I mean, you know, it's... Uh, you know. Yeah, sure. Beware of false prophets who come unto you dressed in sheep's clothing and underneath they are ravening wolves. But who's that? <laughs> uh, now, Mr. Yablonsky, I'd like to ask you this because you have, you have studied very carefully the whole hippie mentality. I was, I was in Chicago and uh, uh, so were a lot of people who would not really have recognized what happened on the basis of Mr. Sanders' description. But I do think that Mr. Sanders uh, uh, means it. Knows I think that he really thinks that cops were looking for old ladies to maim uh, and gentle people to savage. And, that, uh, and, and I think that the fact that he thinks it is interesting. Now, what uh, happened? Is, is, is this... Yeah, I know. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think... Uh, I, I would like to hear your analysis of why it is that they seem to feel it compulsive to believe that a daily, who was after all a, a, a hero of John F. Kennedy and Bobby oh, Kennedy, what hero? whom you associate with the best of the aspirations of the youth, uh, uh, how come they feel this way? What is it in their creed that requires Well, first this? of all, I wouldn't hook Daly in with JFK and that. <laughs> he's, a, he's a big city boss. But I think that I just observed uh, you and others on television uh, in Chicago. Um, I Nothing think bellicose <laughs> about me, was yeah, it? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to slug someone in. But, uh, I think uh, that if the people who were involved uh, with the hippies or the yippies had been permitted uh, to uh, to sort of do their thing and and to chant and to have a peaceful but, march. But that thing and involved the assassination of a few Democrats, didn't it? No. Oh no, Absolutely not at all. No, in no, some no. Cases, I think so. there were around maybe ten thousand young people there who would have uh, uh, sang peace songs in the park and done things like that. Now I do believe. Yeah, but in fact, they threw bricks. And oh in fact, well, I think to there were there were there was uh, apparently a lot of frustration. Yeah. Uh, uh, of, of their efforts to do something uh, uh, now, loving wait in, a minute, that, yeah. in that direction. Look, and, uh, you know Tom Hayden, you know Rennie Davis, you know these characters. I yeah, know I do. Them. Everybody here knows them. 
And we know that the, these are not sweet little old flower children. But they didn't have anything they to do with They are the... here intending to make a scientific <laughs> ideological point, which is to engage the police in violence in order not to a... try to produce... Uh, I'll be right with you. In order to try to produce a wave of sympathy, which they succeeded, and they are absolutely elated. It would have been impossible for the Scared. police to withdraw in such a way as to satisfy I, them, because the only way they could have been satisfied is by forcible encounter. You asked me about I mean, the hippies yeah. and the hippies, and yeah, I'm right talking about what they would have done. Now, I, I tend to agree with you that there were other uh, uh, segments uh, of the population, uh, possibly including the Blackstone Rangers Can I say something? And, oh, yeah. uh, uh, and other groups in, in, uh, who, were, who were prepared uh, to stir something up uh, if it didn't happen. But I think the, the, there was such an overreaction and such a, uh, uh, tr uh, a, a trigger finger kind of situation that uh, these kids began to open the thing up and before anything could get going, there was a lot of smashing. And then the others moved in, and uh, I think there would have been kind of a, uh, uh, a love-in type of scene in Chicago by a large segment of the young people. Mm -hmm. If you could have separated if, the two, yes. Well, because they were very clearly separated. Until they were mixed together, the, there were two movements operating in Chicago. The Yippies wanted Lincoln Park, which is many, many miles away from the amphitheater and as many miles away from the Hilton. They wanted to have a festival of life with rock music in the park, with, uh, uh, with theater classes, with guerrilla theater, with like various uh, uh, poets and people coming together for a festival of life. What is guerrilla theater? Guerrilla theater is a bunch of people who engage in, uh, who don't need props and who don't need uh, uh, a they, regular stage. Do they crucify chickens? Well, no, that, that's not guerrilla theater. But anyway, the, the guerrilla theater people just need themselves and their own body makeup and, you know, a few pro props like that. Well, anyway, uh, we wanted Lincoln Park. We wanted to have and have to use the beach to uh, swim and sleep at. And uh, the Chicago authorities continually thwarted us throughout a whole six months of negotiations, refusing at any point to allow any demonstrations. So that uh, we were forced, they drove, literally drove Allen, Jean Genet, William Burroughs, uh, even Clive Barnes, the New York Times, were driven out of the park at night Good. to <laughs> buy tear gas. That's terrible. That's true, by tear gas, by, these, uh, by cops who refuse to let peaceful people. Mm -hmm. So all these people were forced into the streets and with no place to go except for the benevolence of a couple of churches to sleep. So they were, and there was a, there was a bus strike in Chicago, there was a cab strike, mm -hmm. and the, the, there was no live TV coverage of anything, so they were forced into the street. The police attacked, pushed, mauled, maimed. I mean, it's really what happened. Now, the other movement was the mobilization movement, which wanted, they wanted to march on the amphitheater. And that's Ronnie Davis, and that's Tom Hayden, but also Dave Dillinger, who's an avowed pacifist, benevolent leader of some standing, and they wanted, mm -hmm. they wanted to have a peaceful march on the amphitheater, split up into groups, and those who wanted to march on would march on. Those who wanted to sit down would sit down, but there was never any violent confrontation planned. And when the Chicago people thwarted and frustrated constantly, anybody's attempts to have a peaceful demonstration, naturally frustrations, it, it mounted, but the, the amount of brick throwing was so negligible compared to the number of peaceful people there for a peaceful purpose, namely to protest with their, with their loving bodies what was going down at the, uh, at the uh, uh, alcoholic amphitheater. <coughs> what were you saying, Mr. Carrack? Uh, I said there are people who make a, a rule of creating chaos so that once the chaos is underway, they can then be elected as the people who take care of the chaos. So. And do you think that this applies to the Chicago situation? No, I'm not talking about daily. I don't know anything about him. I wasn't there, but I'm talking about his idea of protesting and running around and making noise all over the place. If you create chaos, you can become the com commissar of the control of chaos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, That's my idea. kind I of see it. situation that was operative there. Uh, <clears throat> to go back to Prague, maybe to the 30s, a guy named Kapek wrote a book called R.U.R. Oh, okay. Right, okay. great writer. Uh, related to uh, the <laughs> universal robots. No, Kafka. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. And he, what he was doing was making a statement about the fact that man is turning into kind of a machine, that there's no love, there's no communication, no humanity. 
And in Chicago, we had a political machine, which was uh, airtight plastic, solid as a rock. And here were uh, some uh, antagonists, but not really antagonists. They were people who were trying to uh, uh, be spontaneous, uh, to do something else, to loosen the situation up. And we had these forces uh, kind of at, at uh, opposite ends of the, of the uh, continuum, and, they, and, and a, a clash took place. I think this was part well, of the problem there. I, I think that that's an interesting uh, theory, but I'm not sure how convincing it is in the light of the fact that the, uh, the, the Democratic Party was by no means uh, airtight. It may have been airtight up against people who wanted to storm the amphitheater and burn it down, but it was certainly not airtight in terms of the tussles going on uh, within it. There was very spirited debate, and there was a very high permeability there for ideas that were fired in from about every uh, uh, democratic philosopher in America. Now, in, in other words, this, this was not a Tito-like, uh, uh, neat little nominating session uh, but it, it well, looked for a while as, as, as though Teddy Kennedy would be nominated. If yeah, I think there was lip service given to an open convention, but I think the, well, that's uh, you at the heart of the matter, it was all uh, set. Now, wait a minute. Uh, now, wait right down now, look, to the... Look, 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 when, when it's all set, it can mean nothing more than that people have made up their minds. Now, if, the, uh, if, uh, if we decide in this room that, it, that uh, our duty is to free speech, uh, require us to listen to the nostrums of, let's say, the Labour Progressive Party. Mm -hmm. uh, but having listened to them, we then proceed to reject them. I don't think we have a right to say that our views were airtight, closed well, against them. There's evidence that the point is, thought wasn't... Uh, that a, lot, a lot of people had decided that they wanted Humphrey, and a lot of people uh, weren't shaken in their particular resolution, which doesn't necessarily make it a static convention, does it? Yeah, but you don't have to stack the galleries with We Love Daily signs. You don't have to shake down Mrs. McCarthy just because she's, you know, and try to insert her purse when she's surrounded by four Secret Service guards. You don't have to run people up the wall and smack them down. Uh, well, if you that's inept to you. A lot of people say you don't have to publish the kind of yeah, stuff but you publish you... in order to love people. Well, then, you know, why don't we just uh, unite with the Russians and, and dance around? I mean, well, you know, well, I mean, you, see, you yeah. want yeah. No, you no, know that, what my that, mother calls Humphrey? I don't know. Flat <laughs> faced Fluji with the Floy Floy. <laughs> I gather. I'm surprised, he wasn't, I'm surprised he wasn't nominated vice president. And you know what Agnew's real name is? Anagnostopoulos, which means the son of the reader. And in Messenia, in ancient Greece, the Turks had taken over ancient Greece, Messenia. Yeah. And they said, don't read, you're censored. And his father read all the books, you know, the Bible and everything. And said, and someday you'll become proud vice name. president. <laughs> huh? I said, someday you'll become <laughs> vice president. I. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, the, re the, re the reason uh, that and I think all this is interesting. My father, my mother, and my sister, and I have always voted for Republican. Always. We voted for Hoover. For have God you no sake. ambition? <laughs> I was six years old voting for Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Kicking well, bottom leaves around side. the gutters. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the only thing that, that yeah. the type of police state oppression forces on us is the next convention we're going to have to take ten thousand of us and run naked through the streets with smeared with strawberry preserves or something. I mean, you know, gonna, <laughs> maybe I can lick you. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, maybe. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, mean, I say, I say, uh, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, they they force you into an incredible incredible position in the world when you want to protest or you want to uh, make your voice known in a benevolent way and yet at the same time you, you're you're pushed and clubbed you know and, and you make your fa you, you make yourself famous by protest that's not who does not you. me no why make myself famous by singing uh, smut I made myself famous <laughs> by writing by writing uh, songs and lyrics about the beauty of the things that I did and the ugliness too you're a great you make poet, yourself famous admit. by saying, down with this, down with that, no. throw eggs at this, throw eggs at that. I, I Take hope it not. with you. That's not what I want. I cannot use your abuse, you may have it back. Okay, you're still, you're a great poet, and we admire you. In fact, it's your fault that we're like... Now, Mr. Yablonski, in your book, you, you list what you call the, the psychedelic creed, and I, I, I take it that... Uh, 
these are articles of faith to which most hippies would, would adhere. And I think it would be interesting to check them out uh, uh, with Mr. Sanders and, uh, and Mr. Kerouac. For instance, you say that the hippie movement is a spontaneous evolution. It is not a heavy worked out plan, right? Most people yeah, agree would, with that. I would say that those uh, creeds are kind of summarizations of based on uh, several hundred interviews with people on the scene right. and what they say. It's not especially yeah, yeah, what I, I know, say. I know. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it wasn't handed out in some tablet, but you infer right. it. Yeah, okay. Now, then you say, drugs are a key to the God uh, in men. Drugs are sacraments for a greater knowledge of the universe. Drugs are a vehicle to a cosmic uh, a consciousness. Is a considerable a considerable consensus on this point? Well, a lot of people uh, in in the movement uh, do take the position that the the way is that every man is a god, uh, and it's a very uh, individualistic uh, kind of a of a movement. Uh, each individual uh, should be free in quotes to do his own thing, whatever that may be. It's rather anarchistic, actually, and I think here the s are the seeds of its. Uh, well, failure. how are standards arrived at in hippie culture on the basis of which one decides whether somebody's thing is is teacher insufferable? Teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, I I I uh, I just want to finish this and then uh, uh, I saw someone uh, assaulting uh, someone uh, at a commune up, yeah. in, up in Northern so California, and I started to intervene, and several people rather gently said, "Well." He's just going through his violence bag. Uh, let him do his own thing. And I say, well, what if he kills him? Uh, you know. And uh, they, uh, their position was everyone should be free to do their own number. I don't share this uh, view, and, and uh, uh, but this is uh, uh, part of the. Do you, do, you, do you endorse that particular impulse, well, I, uh, I've, Sanders? I've uh, seen a lot of communes, and I've never seen a commune that really tolerated violence. I think that's one of the character, chief characteristics of a community of free people, that they would, they, they're there to get away from violence. And when there's like drug-induced violence or, or other types of violence, it's generally, in my view, in my experience, it's generally quelled. You mean kibbutzes? No. Well, that's one part of it. Every, one every, when every, have commune, yeah. every commune I went to, uh, people were, I saw some degree of violence and anarchy and, and uh, chaos. And they would tell me that about another one, and I went to around four, and the last one was, I, I was way uh, back in, in the hills, and uh, I was rather frightened uh, because uh, there was a... Uh, uh, a rather high degree of violence. There were a lot of people freaked out on, on drugs. Uh, it was uh, a rather chaotic uh, scene. And how do the victims of this violence characteristically react? Ouch. They're hurt. <laughs> <laughs> like, like most people do. To but but, the, but they, ha they have no mechanism to which to appeal, correct? Right. Uh, uh, this was one of the few times in my life I wish there were police around. Uh, uh, oh, there goes the black flag of anarchy. <laughs> well, would you say that the, the, their leaders are, quote, spontaneous, they're not pushy leaders who are self-appointed, they're selected by hippie constituents because they are, quote, spiritual centers. How are they selected? And what authority, once selected, do they have? Well, the, the theme, uh, the philosophical theme, would be that certain individuals are, are purer, uh, more loving, uh, more tuned in to uh, uh, nature and other people than others, and that people seek them out as, uh, as yeah, leaders. Yeah, what authority do they have? Hey, uh, they yeah. they uh, <laughs> deny having any uh, and claim to have uh, uh, no power. So, so that a victim in one of these situations would get nowhere by addressing his complaints to the, quote, leader, because the leader would have no authority to address those grievances. Well, there's I, no tight organization. Are we talking about reality or not? I mean, do, you know, it, I've never seen such a situation where, you know, capital uh, he's talking about uh, well, remote communes. communes. He's written a book well, about he's written, it. He's yeah, observed indeed, it with But his he's own talking eye, about, yeah. a com type of, de say, a desert commune or a commune that's isolated from the fabric of the police fabric. Now, I'm familiar with the communes in New York City, for instance, where you're constantly uh, reacting and relating to the so-called other other world, you know, with it, and uh, so the, w 
you know, you're really not, ne you're really never without police protection. You know, you, everybody usually they have a phone or something. Well, up in Big Sur, yeah, in places well, like that, you're, uh, you know, people but the are, point are is wiped that out. There's no, the, well, you see, I think we're emphasizing violence, and it, and, and it doesn't right happen. Right. I sit, and I was at Big Sur. Yeah. When, when were you there, uh, Jack? Oh, get off of it. I lived you there lately? Uh, I lived with a mule up there. <laughs> well. It, it, is, is, it, is it okay for a hippie to call the police when he needs help, or is of that course. considered uh, uh, anti something? Sure, you got some snuffer going to get you, you say, you call the police, of course, why not? I mean, you know, you can, it's, you're, you're, you're attaching all these theoretical tags. That's, that's the problem with using the word hippie, in that it's a tag, you know? You can't say they're anarchistic to the degree. They, they're all, they all have middle-class equipment, a lot of them, and they can plug right back in, you know? It's easy, it's easy. gee, let's see, you know, police, yeah, right, you dial, you know I mean? You know, 911. Well, right? Isn't one of the uh, goals of a lot of people on the scene to to turn off all middle class values and to uh, tune into some other uh, sense of reality? Nixon is existence? the middleman. Man for the middleman well, and Agnew. Uh, you know, I think the whole the whole the Leary's. You know, the, you know what we're really involved in is the word what the definition of the word drop out. You know, and I think that. That uh, the thinking, thinking quote hippies are involved in uh, a new type of, a new interpretation of what dropping out means. It really, you know, like you, you naturally cre you naturally retain some some connections with, say, the police and the hospital and the fire department. But and isn't the this a legal aid and the medicals uh, and retention? Uh, you know, the, the things your parents laid on you. And Thank you. I'm glad they laid hospitals on me. I mean, you know, it's like. Ed. <laughs> huh? huh? You hear me, Ed? I was arrested two weeks ago, and the arresting policeman said, I'm arresting you for decay. <laughs> <laughs> what the devil was that? <laughs> I, I, I assume he was able to prove it. <laughs> well, this, this may be the start of a new movement. <laughs> Decayists? <laughs> Just, he said decay. All right, we have a question here on the floor. Mr. Yablonski, I'm interested in what kind of a future you see for the hippie movement. Well, I think a lot depends on uh, American society. If, if it uh, becomes more open and uh, uh, less plastic, uh, more loving, and a lot of the rigidified institutions that have developed, like many, uh, a lot of our families and whatever, if things begin to change, there won't be any need for people to uh, react uh, in, in, this, in a rather extreme form looking for love. It will be found in the, uh, in the regular <coughs> social system. And uh, in that case, it'll, it'll, it will disappear. It, or it may grow if things become more rigidified or if Nixon gets elected. Or, uh, I'd like to comment on that and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that uh, it, it, it may very well grow to the extent uh, that we all uh, encourage uh, a uh, intellectual uh, uh, irresponsibility uh, and b personal uh, irresponsibility it may very well be that the psychologists are correct who say that precisely what has encouraged the hippie movement to become irresponsible is is a complete lack of, of leadership and maybe that when we start writing books about them we ought even to muster up the courage to say certain things they do, they ought not to be permitted to do. Oh, yes, question over there. <clears throat> Would any of you regard the hippie movement uh, not only as a reflection of the inadequacies of the society as a whole, but also as a manifestation of the uh, psychological inadequacies of the individual hippies themselves? Yes, sir. Well, I think... Uh, there, there's uh, such uh, freedom within the framework of the movement that people that society would classify as, in quote, psychotic, <coughs> are allowed to, uh, to do their thing, and uh, they, they live and eat, and they're taken care of by others, and uh, appreciated. In fact, uh, uh, to a great extent, I think that this is one of the interesting facets of the hippie movement, that there's a humane approach to people who society would label uh, in, in some uh, uh, extreme fashion. And so there are a lot of young people who, are, uh, who don't make it, 
through the usual channels who find uh, a life for themselves in the, on the hippie scene. Mm. But, but uh, the question itself poses a methodological challenge, doesn't it? Because it's hard to establish by mutually agreed on means what normalcy consists in, right? Right. I mean, maybe Mr. Sanders is normal for all we know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I am too. <laughs> well, if, if, <laughs> well, if, if, if people get nude, as Ed described, and put strawberry jam on, I think he said strawberry, and run through strawberry the streets, <laughs> as a, you know, the hundreds, if, if if then, hundreds do this, it's, it's kind of a movement. If one guy does it, uh, he'll get arrested in a moment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. unless he gets some followers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Of course, it's all very Why do you want followers? Uh, St. Francis, all I one has to do is be him. like him, which is uh, another talent. Yeah. Uh, did you want to comment on that, Mr. Kerouac? Sorry. I, I was asking why he wants followers. Who? Him. Mr. Sanders? Abramo Witz, or what his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Don't What's be anti Semitic with me. Eh? <laughs> I happen to be Jewish. That's My the name classic is Jablonsky. answer, isn't it? Yeah. What is the classic answer? To call you by your name. Well, why'd you call me Abramowitz? I don't well, know. Well, uh, what is it? Yablonsky. Oh, Yablonsky. Well, let's see. <laughs> hey, you didn't, you didn't mean to be rude, Polish. did you, Oscar? Come on now. No, no, no. I, I oh, thought. Okay. Uh, so I, I forgot his that. name. Now, did you want an answer to that? Answer that question. <laughs> which, <laughs> which question? <laughs> well, the question uh, obviously not. <laughs> so we yes, yes, I'll answer here. the question over there about the methodological. Oh. Yeah. It's about emotional paraplegics. <laughs> no, no, what was the question you wanted to ask? Let's get another one. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This lady's been waiting. I can answer that one, too. Yeah. You know. I can answer any <laughs> question. Here's one for you. Now, wait a minute. As far as the hippies and the people who live in the communes and those who work in the bands, do they plan on make it, making it a lifetime occupation? Like, are they just going to sit down and watch the world go by? Because they don't well, really do anything. That's not what they're doing. Well. Everybody sits down and part of their time and watches the world goes by. But the people who live in communes, what are they doing? Are they, well, they adding anything they're living, good it's, to it's called, uh, they're pre it's like uh, there are certain religious movements, like the Brethren or the Quakers, who don't believe, believe in proselytizing, but uh, live by example. And you'll never get uh, any uh, queries from the Church of the Brethren to join their uh, belief, but at the same time they try to live a, a, an exemplary life. And that's, that's probably the main motiv motivation behind a commune life, you know, rather than say, come here and join us, they would show an example and hopefully a crew. Do you plan to be a fug when you're 50? Well, I'm 50? Yeah. I'm 50, uh, I plan to be uh, an emotional paraplegic uh, smoking peace herbs. Neurasthenic psychotic. <laughs> oh, uh, I, you know. You think that would be an improvement, Mr. Carroll? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you said psychotic when you said, no, said I think neurasthenic. that's a good point. How about, how about this youth business? Well, why, why should, uh, why should this particular impulse uh, uh, evanesce? Why, when you get to be around 30 or 35, you think, oh, I'm going to put my youth behind me and, and uh, uh, go to work at the First National Bank? Well, a lot of the young people who are in this movement, uh, they look up and they see their 50-year-old father who did everything, has all the goodies, 2.8 cars and three houses and whatever, and, and he's kind of miserable and he's not communicating with his <laughs> wife and whatever and, and they say well if I go to the right schools and do all these things this is what's going to happen to me well I'm going to try something else and I think this is part, uh, the hippie movement is partly this uh, uh, kind of a social experiment a part, partly a social experiment that um, uh, understands the likelihood of its own futility uh, put it this way, will anybody be thinking about the hippies 10 years from now other than in the sort of a hula skirt sense? <laughs> uh, just something that happened. I'm and, not well, no, by then the hippies will be in the command generation and all the pot-smoking law students and all the young legislators who are introducing legalization of pot bills and all the young professionals who are, uh, quote, turned on and articulate and who are aware of Mr. Kerouac, Mr. Ginsburg's great contribution to... American you civilization. Hope. I'm not connected with Ginsburg. In other words, you'll put okay. my name next to his. Okay, Mr. Kerouac's <laughs> contribution to American civilization, those people will be, quote, the command generation and hopefully retain some of the humane uh, attributes. <laughs> command generation? Well, Heil that's Hitler. what they're going to be. That's what Time magazine calls it. I don't call it. Anyway.